Alrighty y'all, back with another video. So just like the poll said, a lot of you guys wanted to see why I set up my Spear LT the way I did. So I'm gonna show you as quick as I can, hopefully one take, but if there's a few cuts, then hey, I just suck at talking. So let's get right into it. We're gonna go from booty to tip, unlike Grantham says tip the butt. We're gonna be going over not only price, but why I got the parts, of course as the title probably says. First part I'm gonna be talking about is the Midwest Industries AK Alpha Stock. So you guys may be wondering, why the hell did you get an AK stock for a AR looking weapon? Well, that's because of two big reasons. Cheek adjustability and it is a six position. Obviously the SIG MCXs, they come with fixed stocks and yeah, they do have the collapsible ones, but you know what? Those collapsible ones don't have a adjustable cheek weld, so. You guys are probably wondering why the hell did you spend $300 on a stock? One, looks really cool. Two, have the money for it. Three, feels really good. The butt pad is wide and big, feels good on my shoulder. Cheek weld, if I don't like it, I can just move it up and down. And then of course, I have the ability to change it from one to the sixth position, which is pretty badass. I do want to show you guys something I did with the stock. So obviously, this uh, stock was made for AKs, so it came with this hideous folding knuckle right here. This thing is absolutely ugly as hell. So, of course, I wanted to use a SIG's proprietary folding knuckle that it came with. That being said, I had to jury rig this thing pretty badly. There is a nut between the folding knuckle and the stock to, you know, space it a little bit. And then I have two pieces of brass from a 9mm round to keep the stock straight. So, if I extend this, you can see the stock is somewhat in line with the weapon. I'm pretty sure it's very in line pretty good and then of course looks good works well so yeah i'll show you guys a little clip on uh, how i did that split the body of a bullet so I can make a little wedge there to make the stock straight. Alrighty, I will be putting the prices of these parts on the screen after I talk about them or say a price, so don't worry. And I'll add up the total at the end, excluding and including the Spear LT. Okay, next I'm gonna get into the safety. The Spear LT's ambi safety that it comes with Highly favors right-handed shooters. Sadly, I am a wrong-handed shooter. So I had to get something a little more extended on the right side so I can manipulate the safety a lot better. So while I'm manipulating the safety, fire and then save. Fire, save, fire, save. Last time I checked, the safety was kind of absurdly priced. Luckily, I had spares from another Ultra Duty lower parts kit. I'm pretty sure this thing ran for like 80 bucks for a safety. Yeah, it's pretty pretty crazy, but it's not as bad as Radian. Radian, they sell crazily expensive safeties for such a short throw. Alrighty, onwards. Next, I'm gonna be talking about the takedown pins. These are the Geisley Ultra Duty Checkered Takedown Pins. The reason I changed them is because the stock takedown pins for the Spear LT, if anyone owns a Spear LT, they're extremely hard to push out. For the Mark 18 I had, I, I could push that out and pull it out with my thumbs. For this, even with these better takedown pins, I do have to use a tool for it. I'm weak, I'm sorry. These takedown pins I did order separately for this, and they're about $25, 20 something like that. So the next part I have on here is a pretty significant part, for me at least, as a left-handed shooter. It is the Knight's Armament Ambidextrous Mag Release. Here it is. This is the Knight's Ambidextrous Mag Release. I'll show you guys it in action in a second. Sorry for all the carbon leaking out of this gun. I try to wipe it as much as I could before the video. This thing is the best ambidextrous magazine release I've ever used on the Spear. I've tried the stock MB mag release, which was horrible. I tried CMMG, which is a little better, but I still hated it. And uh, I also tried the Troy MB mag release, which was better than the other two, but still not as good as the Knights. Just to show you guys how great it is, I'll do a quick little reload for you. 
I do believe, like the safety, the mag release was kind of an absurd price, but we're buying from Knights, so it's kind of expected. I think these run for around $110 to $130. Obviously, I'll put the actual price up here. And now onto the last lower receiver part, which is gonna be the trigger. So to be fair, I've had a lot of time behind mil spec triggers like on the FNM4 that's currently uh, issued to most people in the military. And I have hands-on experience with three Geisley triggers and a number of drop-in triggers, which I never recommend to anybody. Out of all of the triggers I have tried, I've tried the Geisley SSA, SSAE, and the SD3G, the Super Dynamic 3 gun, I believe that's what it's called. And my favorite is for sure the SSAE flat, which is what I have in here. So the reason I like the SSAE flat so much is because everything on the trigger is predictable. Like the other two guys' triggers, the other two do this too. It's just this one has my preferred pull weight, which is a 3.5 to 4 pound uh, trigger pull, which is perfect in my opinion. The uh, three gun is just too light and the SSA is a little heavier for shooting fast and uh, I like to shoot fast. Just great take up, great wall, great break, and a great reset. Can't go wrong with Geisley. I think on a normal day, this trigger does run for around 240. Onward to probably the most important part of a rifle is the optic. So you'll see on here, I don't have any iron sights. Uh, one, I don't have room for them. And two, I'm pretty confident that the ACOG and the RMR are more durable than iron sights anyways. If I dropped an ACOG or an RMR, head level onto concrete i really doubt there's going to be much damage to it besides scratches but if i dropped a pair of mbus pros that are flipped up onto a concrete floor at my height which i'm a little over six foot uh i'm pretty sure those mbuses will bend or break so again never tried it but that's just me using my little head right so that's the reason i don't have iron sights Anyways, why did I pick the RMR and Trigicon ACOG over an LTVO or an EOTech magnifier? Let's go through the process of elimination here. The reason I didn't go with the EOTech magnifier, which would probably be the second choice, is because I have to do a second motion with my support hand, which is, you know, it takes a lot more time than just tilting the weapon. Let's say I'm, I'm firing at a somewhat distance, I'm firing at like 75 yards, I want to use the ACOG, right? Bang, 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 I can do that. And if I need to transition to my one times, all I have to do is flip my weapon 30 degrees, boom, right there, and I'm on a one times dot. That's why I didn't get an EOTech and magnifier. I opted for the more durable option as well. This is more durable than the EOTech or LTVO, of course. Why didn't I pick the LTVO? The big reason I didn't pick an LTVO is, let's say you have a 1 to 6, 1 to 8, 1 to 10 LTVO. Let's be completely honest, when you're using an LTVO, when is the last time you genuinely wanted to pick a zoom level in between 1 and 6, 1 to 8, 1 and 10, right? Last time I seen videos on people using LTVO, they either do one power or the max power on them. And again, it's just an extra movement with your hand to change from one power to 10 power. You could argue, oh, why don't you put an RMR on the side, like how this is mounted? Well, the reason for that is what's the point of buying an LTVO if you're not gonna use the one time setting on the LTVO and you're just gonna use a dot. Um, it just defeats the purpose of the LTVO, I believe. Variable optics are a lot better on longer range weapons. And to be frank, this is just a 16 inch Spear LT. I'm not gonna be shooting past like five, 600 yards anyways. And if I am shooting at 300 plus yards, I am not in a good situation. That's why I opted for the ACOG RMR combo. I did sight these at two different distances. I sighted the RMR at 25 yards. It was a 0 0.38 inch group. The group is like this big. I did take my sweet, sweet time. So that's why I got it that small. For the ACOG, I shot at 100 yards. Sighted for 100 yards, I got a sub 2 MOA group. I think my grouping was like, it was either 1.7 or 1.55. It was in between that. I was hitting consistently with the ACOG. So I think a sub 2 MOA group at 100 yards with an ACOG is pretty good, especially for a weapon that was made to contract the government, which aren't the most accurate weapons in the first place. So how much did this cost me? Um, the ACOG. Not too bad, 1100, 1100, 1200 for a TA31 uh, four times with the Chevron. Armar 480 to 500, I forgot. I'll put them both here for today's prices. 
And then of course I have the Unity fast mount for the ACOG slash VCOG if you wanna put the VCOG on there. And then I have a 35 or 36 degree offset for it that I mounted around here. A little different color grade because you know I wanna be different sometimes. But it's on there, looks great. I love how much closer it is to my face than the Arisaka offset mount. The Arisaka was sitting all the way up here. The closer the red dot is to my face, the bigger the window seems to me. And it's just a little more easier to find my target, find the dot, all that stuff. Because I need that little advantage because I do suck. This Unity mount with the offset and the RMR mount or plate, whatever you want to call it. I think it was a little over 200, maybe 250. All right, now I'm moving to the last few parts of the setup, which is gonna be on the forend. And of course, I'm gonna be going with the durability option. So I got a Surefire M600 or M640. I think it's the M600 Scout Lite with the Surefire button, which this button is a little too much for how much, uh, I I'm sorry, but that is one thing I'll say, really $200 for a button. For a toggle button and a pressure pad is kind of crazy but you know what got it because why not and it works really well so i'll give it that 200 dollars well not sure for 200 bucks i'm expecting an ai generated light that will blind people at its own will but we'll work with what we got next on here i do have these slate black rail covers these work really well they're decently cheap too. Most of the times I don't praise cheap things, but this is one thing I do like a lot is the Slate Blacks. I think they're around $12, $13 for a pack of three. Um, on here I have five of them because my support hand needs to get covered. So I have one on my non-support side. And then I, on the other side, I have one on the bottom and then three covering the whole side of the m -lock rail on this side. So my hand would be covered on all sides. Next, I have these Magpul cable management thingies. I don't, I forgot what they're called, but these also work really well. They've never fallen off on me. And look how neat it makes it look. Um, really, you don't need it. You could just use a hair tie, but I want it to be a little extra. Throw these on here so this wire has no chance of getting in my way ever or getting snagged on anything. That's why those are on there. I think these are around $10, $12 as well. Could be wrong onto the bottom of the rail so before i was running the bcm gunfighter grip i do love this grip so so much but because this is a decently long lop or length of pull i do have a longer uh, wingspan even so my arms are kind of pushing it out there i don't know if you can see at this angle they are kind of pushing it out there it does i do get a little fatigue having a straight grip really helps reduce the fatigue in my arm when i'm shooting for a long time when I have an angle grip, it kind of forces me to like want to pull in to my arm. And I know it's really just a habit thing. But that being said, got rid of the gunfire grip. Leave that there. Love it so much. And I put a Samsung frag grip on here. This is a two-tone frag grip. I got this grip for maybe $56 at a gun store. So it's probably going to be a little more cheaper online. $56 at a gun store. Alrighty, so onto the very, very front and bottom of the rail. I have a SLR Rifle Works barricade stop. I don't know if I can find the comment, but someone stated it was a hand stop. Why would you put a hand stop up there when you can't reach it? I agree, why would I do that? Good thing I didn't do it, right? I believe this is the type two barricade stop. Reason for getting it is, so when I run into a wooden barricade of sorts or anything that's, you know, a little less, uh, hard than metal that I can just jab my weapon into and get that small amount of stability. This will help a lot. I'll give you a small demonstration without damaging the walls in this place. Small example, let's say I wanted to mount on here. All I have to do is jam in this. My weapon is not moving anywhere, right? Uh, people would opt to push this a little back so it does have a little support from the hemlock rail, but I don't see the point in that because when you're bracing off of an object, you're pushing into it decently hard regardless. So the SLR barricade stock ran for about $35, $40, somewhere around there. It's not too off that price if I did get it wrong. Now we're gonna get to the third to last part, which is a very small but very significant part. When I first got this weapon and threw me a muzzle brake on there, somebody commented on the post, I think they said I needed something called a barrel collar if I wanna run it suppressed and I should probably have one before putting any aftermarket muzzle devices on it regardless. Thankfully, they told me that. I really did appreciate that. Went ahead, went on to SIG's website, ordered me one. I tried to call and get a free one. They said, no, you had to buy it. So I was like, okay, I'll buy it. That little 
piece of metal right there is the barrel collar. The barrel collar ran like $15, $15, $20. Now onto the second to last part. Uh, I have good things and bad things to say about it. This part is the Surefire War Comp. The reasons I like it do outweigh the reasons I don't like it. So that is good. This thing ran me for about $150 to $180. I have the ports tied to left-handed shooter for myself. So if any right-handed shooters use this, uh, sorry. Last piece of puzzle, course suppressor. Yeah, I can use this for anything that has a SOCOM mount on it, but I got this specifically for the Spear LT. And that's why I got the mini version and not the RC2. RC2 is around six and a half inches is five inches long. If you really think about it, there's only this much suppressor actually adding to the barrel. That's like a two inch extension past the muzzle device. So it's not that much bigger than the weapon by itself. The suppressor costs around 1050, uh, excluding the tax stamps, excluding the transfer fee, all of that stuff. Let's throw this thing on here. I'm gonna show you guys that it's not carbon locked even after a couple thousand rounds. We're on there, twist it until you hear the little click. Click, and then tighten it. One little quarter rotation and it's good to go. And of course you can't go wrong with the beauty shot of the weapon. So here it is. Okay, well, that's all I have for this video. If you guys agree with how I set this up, please comment down below and give me all the praise in the world. If you guys don't agree with me, tell me how you would set up a 5.56 16 inch Spear LT. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed the little breakdown of why I set up my weapon the way I did. Again, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys next time.